Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to a regular meeting of Asilius Town Council, Tuesday, September the 4th at 2 o'clock p.m. in Council Chambers. Uh, first item on the agenda would be the adoption of some minutes. We're looking for a committee of the whole minutes from August the 20th, regular open minutes from August the 20th, public hearing minutes from August the 21st, and special open meeting minutes of August the 28th. Any comments from Council on those minutes? Hearing none, they will be adopted by consensus. Uh, business arising resolution from the closed meeting held August the 20th, 2012. Mr. Ramango? <clears throat> I'm sorry, I was just... Uh, oh, okay. Uh, let me just get that on the... Mike's declaration. Uh, Do we have that resolution? Yes. yes. Okay, that would be wonderful. Thank you, Ms. Van Vianen. Okay, uh, the resolution from August 20th, 2012, in-camera meeting. Um, motion 56312, moved by Councillor Plant and seconded by Councillor Ryan and resolved that Council approve the Marina Development Agreement between Osea Shoreline Development and the Town and that the signatories be authorized to sign. And we're looking for that to be accepted into this meeting. Okay. Uh, so that was moved at that meeting. That was moved and seconded. What we're looking for is just that it be released. Uh, brought into the brought into the regular from That's the right. closed. Okay. Uh, do we need a resolution on that? Yes. Okay. Could we have that, Councillor Rhodes, Councillor McCordoff? Any discussion on that? Uh, I guess I have a I have a couple of words. Hallelujah, hallelujah. <laughs> uh, that, that was just so great to, to have that finally landed. There have been a lot of questions about it in the community, um, but uh, that, is the, that is the signing of the, the full partnership with Osuya Shoreline Development, the, the builders of Watermark Hotel. And uh, we're, we're in there for, uh, for the sharing of, sharing of all the costs and some of the future costs. Uh, so that was a, it was a big moment when, when that got signed and, and authorized. So now it's, uh, now it's part of the public record. Um, all in favor of that? Opposed? Carried. Thank you. Uh, any late items being proposed? No late items today. Uh, moving into delegations. Uh, we have uh, Burl Jonas Slack Goodman from South Okanagan General Hospital Project Recovery. Ms. Slack, please. Thank you, Mayor, and hello, Mayor and Councillors. Uh, what I would like to do is sort of a who, what, where, when, and why. Just I think briefly. we need a microphone. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and thank you. Uh, thank you. I'd, I'd like to do a who, what, where, when, and why very briefly and allow you to ask whatever questions you want. Uh, I am from uh, rural area A and uh, resident on Long Joe Road. And the, uh, the subject, what, is the South Okanagan General Hospital. And uh, I remember a fight over getting the hospital and the location thereof, and I think the mayor was also a resident of Oliver at that time. We had the second meeting on the Oval at the high school uh, with a limed line down the center. <laughs> I think Asuius was on the west and Oliver was on the east and they had just spread sludge from the plant on the grass. <laughs> Very pleasant. At any rate, uh, I was on the last local board. B. Becker was chair. Uh, Dr. Um, Shepherd was retired at the time but on the board. Uh, Sue Neville Tirada, who also lives on the mountain, was a member. And at that time, we had voted for um, some of the rooms from acute to be made into one occupant large bathroom for what they called at that time a transition wing. And uh, after we left, it went from a local board where we had residents from each town to a, a health board where there was one member from each town. And uh, in 2001, it went to Interior Health. And we now have one director from Penticton. Not his fault, that's the structure of it. 
But over that time, uh, things have changed and we really weren't aware of the extent of it. Uh, my husband, Eric Goodman, ended up in hospital on the 25th of May. On the 26th, I ended up asking for a chair to sit on and I was told that uh, chairs were in short supply. So I went home and phoned two friends who still resided in Oliver, retired nurses, and I said, you know, put a flea in somebody's ear. Evidently they need chairs, pass it on. So the next morning I happily told them at the nursing station, we don't need chairs, we need room. There's no room in the rooms, those rooms for chairs. So that was fine. I made the mistake of saying, well, let us know what you need and we'll try and make people aware. Then on the, uh, the 4th of June, three months today, uh, I kept an appointment with a doctor in town. And before I could get out that I wanted to renew Eric's prescriptions, he said, get the offices out give us back our rooms so we don't have to double bunk. He wasn't asking for more beds, he was asking for room for the beds they had. And Eric had the pleasure of being in two of those rooms and the man that I went to for advice first off ended up in, in the room in the middle. So at that point we've done the where, what, we want the rooms back for the beds. Uh, I had went to uh, the former chair, B. Becker, and she said I had no idea of the extent to which offices had taken over the patient rooms, and neither did Dr. Shepard or, or Sue Neville. So at that point, uh, who, what, where, when, now, we're working on a public awareness campaign. Initially, I approached uh, the former board members and uh, on advice of my friend whose opinion I value, he said make sure the doctors are on side. Well privately the doctors are on side, publicly they won't squeak, not a word. And the uh, Dr. X will call him, looks very shamefaced because he can't produce a doctor to speak for them, but I've spent three months trying to raise awareness. So at any rate, <laughs> I approached the mayors of the two towns. I approached the reg regional director for Area C because that's where the hospital sits. He asked me for a bit of information on paper, which I passed to him. And uh, he said he wanted it so they could start discussion at the regional hospital board meeting. Well, instead, he told uh, Mayor uh, Perino of Summerland, the chair of that board, to uh, do as you see fit with it. Well, it ended up going straight down to the administration at South Okanagan General, which really wasn't where I wanted to start. I had already made a phone call and found out that I got the top man's woman who passed me to the second top man's woman who wanted to pass me back to Oliver. Well, forget that, it's not going anywhere. I approached uh, our MLA, I approached Penticton's MLA who resides in Oliver and uh, both B. Becker and John Slater said yes, there was space available, uh, vacant because of moves out and uh, then I approached uh, say uh, the MLA from Penticton who said that there's plenty of grass out there meaning maybe there's room for portables but that's sort of out of the question. But there is the vacant space, Oliver and Asuias, for uh, doing something about getting some of the offices out and giving some of the rooms back. So that uh, there have been, uh, at that time, uh, the administration arranged a meeting with myself and the chief of staff. And his view is that all available services existing and yet to be invented should be up and running. And the hospital's a great place for them. And mine is that when you need a bed, you need a bed. That's what the hospital was built for. We fought for it, we pay taxes on it, and, and there you are. I approached the Minister of Health, got an answer back from an aide that he had asked Interior Health 
uh, about things, and the answer was that everything was just fine because Interior Health said it was. And so we're still of the opinion that we, we do need the space for the doctors and nurses to work for patient care and recovery. That, as I said, is what it was built for. Uh, the seniors in Asuias have a petition out. The mountain people put a petition out, and both being well received. The Oliver seniors took a straw vote on uh, prior to the middle of July, and of the 67 people that were there on that afternoon, 67 agreed with us. I'd call that 100 percent. So uh, things have not ceased to roll. We've, we've contacted people uh, in and out of government, uh, anybody who cares to speak up and help. We have 15,134 based population in Oliver, Asuias, A and C. And uh, it was mentioned in the paper that back in 51, with under 11,000, they built a hospital in Penticton. So I think our numbers are valid, they're growing, we need it, and uh, while I don't expect all of you to support us, I would hope that some of you would, and uh, I will keep quiet and let you answer, or ask me questions, and I'll try and answer them, I will answer them honestly. I'm getting no help from the Times, I got one letter printed a week after the letter in Oliver, and I want to explain that I was treating Oliver and Asuias equally because it's our hospital. And uh, down the road, uh, we intend to have a, a show of support, not protest, a show of support or a rally on our lawn at the hospital in Oliver and make a fun occasion out of it. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thanks very, very much, Pearl, and, and thanks for bringing this issue forward and, and shepherding it through, uh, through all the channels that, that you have. Um, I, I think it's a, a, of, of concern. Uh, I was visiting a friend in the hospital with that same, with the two beds in there. Uh, you, I might as well have been visiting both folks because there was certainly no privacy. Chair sort of turned sideways. Um, it, it, re it really wasn't good. And if we're looking at patient care in hospitals, I'm sure the availability of, of uh, being able to receive family and friends and maybe a semblance of privacy uh, would go a long way towards those folks getting better. Um, and if we're looking at the office space, the, the rooms that have been converted from the 42-bed hospital that it was built as, um, when we look at those rooms that are converted to office space, uh, we have half of a building here that used to be Sagebrush Lodge that Interior Health could certainly certainly move their people in. They own them both. They don't have to pay any rent. Uh, they could move some people down into, into this space here. So, um, yeah, it's, it, it, certainly, uh, it certainly could use a, a follow-up uh, on, on that. So uh, I, hope, I hope that this uh, moves forward. And, and uh, we, 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 need, we need good care facilities there. And those, those two beds jammed into those rooms is, is really quite ridiculous. So, Council, Councillor McCordock, please. Yes, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, Mrs. Goodman, I was also on the hospital board. As a matter of fact, I was the chair of the hospital board for a few years, mm -hmm. and I was also on the Sagebrush Lodge board, mm -hmm. uh, so I am familiar with it. I, you and I were on the board at the yes, same time yeah. at one point. Um, I, I'm just wondering, um, after I read your letter, I then read the letter from Dr. Rudiman, which was in last week's paper, and I thought that he uh, took a, a, a slightly different point of view, and I thought he explained it very well. Um, and I think that um, that we need to to look and listen to s at some of the people that are actually working in there, and not just have it uh, one-sided. So I I appreciated reading that letter in there too, and I think we l need to look at both sides. If I may answer that, I've taken that point by point and answered it to the Chronicle, which won't be in print, hopefully tomorrow. Mm -hmm. But uh, he has the part in the middle about the hospital, the doctors, and how much he and his family love it here. That's fine. But the inference that we're asking for new services is wrong, that we're asking for more beds is wrong, because nowhere in this have we asked for more beds. The doctor who sicked me on this wanted more room for the beds we have. Mm -hmm. 
and that's always been quite plain. But they're trying to sidetrack it. And yes, I have asked those within, and as I say, those within will not, cannot speak out. It happened before when I was on the board, mm -hmm. and uh, there are repercussions. So yes, and when I met with Dr. Uh, Entwistle, the chief of staff, uh, he too went public, and uh, therein, um, his side is, is what they want, and no giving back at all. That's their stand. Hmm. No? Uh, Councillor Ryan, please. Yes, thank you. Well, um, yes, thank you very much for, uh, Mr. Sock, for bringing this to our attention. And we have been following it in the, uh, in the newspapers. Is it, uh, I don't know whether you've had any contact with the, uh, the nurses there, and I, and I appreciate what you said about you know, them being circumspect about mm -hmm. what they say. But I can imagine that from an administration point of view, you would, you would want to cluster your patients more for, um, for ease of, of uh, care rather than having them spread out. You know, nurses often complain about how, how much they walk in a day and how they have to go from you know, room to room. Is, has that come out at all in, in discussions that you've had? Not, not in what we have had. They simply say they want more room to work efficiently and, and properly. And if you're trying to work, whether it's a workshop or a hospital or whatever, you can't work in crowded conditions. Mistakes will be made, and I'm not faulting the staff at all. But uh, there was an article about Penticton wanting this, and uh, their union member, uh, male nurse, happened to mention that uh, Perino says they can run it with the same staff, and he says they'd be running their legs off to do it if they put this fancy tower in. But at any rate, the nurses within can't say anything, but I have talked to the nurses' union in the beginning, part way along, and last week, and when we have a rally, they will be there. I didn't ask them. They offered. Okay. Thank you. Uh, any other any other questions or information required from council? Thank you very much for your presentation, Burl. Uh, I'm sure you will have uh, through the through the television process garnered a little bit more support out there as as people understand uh, where where this is going. So, uh, good luck. Good luck on your on your drive. Uh, I know I've been associated with you back from the from the 80s on on, on some of your projects and uh, they've all been successful. I hope this one is too. Thank you very much. As the doctor who sicked me on this said, what we're asking for is not unreasonable. So thank you all very much for this. Thanks, Pearl. Uh, no water matters or correspondence. We'll be moving into the uh, Bylaws uh, 1085.86-2012 Walnut Beach Resort. Uh, Mr. Romanko, please. Thank you, uh, Mayor Wells. Uh, we have in front of us uh, the report from the Planning Department. Uh, some background on uh, July 16, uh, 2012, Council read Bylaw 1085.86-2012 uh, for the first time. And on July, on August 21, 2012, a public hearing was held and there were no public presentations. Uh, the Town of Asoya's zoning bylaw only allows commercial business to operate from a marina. In 2010, staff found it necessary to develop a wait list of commercial businesses wishing to operate on Asoya's lake. As a temporary solution to the problem, Council directed staff to allow commercial businesses to operate on a trial basis from a short list of resorts which had commercial zoning. As it turned out, Walnut Beach Resort was the only resort to take part in the offer. <coughs> Earlier this year, Council directed staff to continue to allow commercial businesses to operate wal from Walnut Beach Resort for the remainder of the 2012 season. Bylaw 1086.86 implements the following Council approved late uh, recreational and commercial use task force recommendations. Uh, commercial businesses should only operate from an approved uh, commercial moorage facility with the proper zoning in place and commercial businesses should not be allowed to operate from a shoreline riparian area. The applicant has also applied to the Integrated Management Bureau of the province to amend their strata moorage tenure to allow uh, the commercial activities from their moorage facility. In terms of impacts, uh, 
community commercial operators provide a service to the community uh, organizationally uh, there's just some time required to issue business licenses uh, budget cost of advertising and convening a public hearing and business licenses generate uh, offsetting revenues sustainability uh, this particular uh, uh, project of complies with the council approved recommendations of the lake recreational uh, commercial uh, task force uh, the options as presented are to give bylaw give the bylaw second and third reading or not to give the bylaw second and third reading and and uh, staff recommends that council give second and third reading to the zoning amendment bylaw 1085.86 2012 thank you were you going to speak to this mr shannon no i was going to read their report but okay <laughs> Just that, just that uh, 20, 20 seconds late. Yeah. Uh, council, please. Council's wishes. Councilor Rhodes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, so I'll move that we give second and third reading to zoning amendment bylaw 1085.86 of 2012. Thank you. And that seconder, Councilor Plant. Any discussion from Council? Uh, Councilor Bryan, please. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Well, I, I would support this. Um, I think there are two two good reasons. One is that uh, we've tried it for a year and it seems to work, and it's it's rectified a, a situation where um, you know we we've got we've got the operator in line with our with our uh, business uh, procedures and so on. And it only applies to this one uh, one development. It's, it's very specific, so uh, it's not uh, not necessarily setting a precedent for anyone else. Thank you. Anything further on that? All in favor? <coughs> Opposed? That is carried. Thanks, Mr. Shannon. Uh, <laughs> uh, next item, uh, Councilor Procedure Amendment Bylaw. Report from Director of Corporate Services, Ms. Van Vienen, please. Thank you. Council adopted Council Procedure Bylaw Number 1271 in 2010. It is in need of some minor amendments. Some slight housekeeping and clarification amendments are required to Bylaw 1271. It is being proposed that it be amended as follows. In Part 2, Paragraph 2, in the definition of agenda package by removing the word and and at the end of the definition. This is a housekeeping as the and is not required. In part three, paragraph 9b, by rewording to include the words cover page after the word agenda, a clarification that only the cover page will be made available at no charge. The entire agenda package is available at a cost of 50 cents per page or online. In part three, paragraph 17, by adding new subsections C and D to read as follows. C, a council member wishing to participate electronically shall give the corporate administration officer no less than one full business day notice of their intent to do so. And D, the member presiding at a council meeting must not participate electronically. This is to allow for time in setting up and or testing any conference calling needed and to ensure that there is pro proper protocol within the meeting and the meeting is held in an area that can be attended by the corporate officer and chair of the meeting so that the chair and the minute taker are in the same location. In part four, paragraph 26, by adding at the end of the current sentence the following, for non-decision items and unanimous resolution of all council members for items requiring council decision. This has been current practice and since 24 hour notice is required of meetings, it clarifies that council can add non-decision making items on the agenda with majority of council consenting, but can only add decision making items on an agenda by waiving the 24 hour notice requirement, which requires unanimous resolution of council. In part four, paragraph 39, by making the current wording subsection A and adding a new subsection B as follows. B, all items for public hearing agendas must be received by the corporate administration officer no later than noon, three town office business days prior to the public hearing. <coughs> and this clarifies the agenda cutoff time for public hearing agenda items. In part eight, paragraph 82, by replacing the current wording to read, only those members of council appointed to a select committee shall attend committee meetings. This wording change is being suggested in order that a select committee meeting cannot be misconstrued as an open council meeting by having a quorum of council in attendance. In part nine, paragraph 86, by removing the word no from the beginning of the sentence, this was a double negative in that sentence, it clears it up. Uh, and the options are that a council procedure amendment bylaw number 1271-01-2012 be read a first, second, and third time, that it be returned to staff for further review, or that it be abandoned 
and staff are recommending it be read three times. Thank you, Ms. Van Vienen. Council's wishes, please. Councilor Ryan. Mr. Mayor, I would, um, I would like to propose that it be read for first, second, and third time, but, um, but I would also, uh, uh, at the same time, uh, change the um, wording in, uh, in item six, which is part eight, paragraph 82, uh, by changing that uh, in the way that I will read in a moment. Okay. If I may. Uh, and that it would be um, that um, any member of council may attend the meeting of any select committee. However, only those members of council appointed to a select committee shall have voice and vote at the committee meeting. And that's, <clears throat> and that's it? That's it, yes. Could you read that again, please? Um, I'll be happy to read that. Uh, we would uh, substitute this for what is in the uh, recommended uh, report. Any member of council may attend the meeting of any select committee. However, only those members of the council appointed to a select committee shall have voice and vote at the committee meeting. Okay. So what does, what does that do with uh, it being regarded as a meeting and a, as a non-posted meeting with, with the presence there? Well, I, I believe I, I haven't. Um, uh, I, I believe that we said that um, in in the uh, current current protocol and the pro current bylaw that um, we will be advised of, of meetings of various committees, mm -hmm. and this would simply mean that uh, if you were so inclined and wished to uh, attend and observe, that you would be able to do so. And okay, I and I understand. I understand where where you're going with this. That so, council, although they weren't on a standing on a select committee, could attend that meeting uh, to receive information. They would simply observe. Yes. But if we had three there, let's say we had three councillors there, is that not deemed a council meeting? Mm -hmm. And and I'll, no. I'll I'll take that a little bit further. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> it would be like a conflict of interest. The fact that you're there, the fact that you're there, um, I think it precludes precludes your silence. Uh, the fact that you're at the meeting, and if we had three councillors there, that w could be deemed a meeting that wasn't duly advertised. Well, I would um, I would respectfully disagree with that interpretation, Mr. Mayor. I, I think that uh, you know by your your presence. Uh, if you have no voice and no vote, you're, you're merely an observer. And, you know, at, at these meetings, uh, if we had the, our minimum requirement for a quorum, um, you know, people would in fact have a vote, even if they didn't choose to say anything. So I, 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 I really personally, I, I, I assess the situation differently. Well, it certainly, it, that, 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 that position wouldn't cover it uh, in a conflict. You can't stay in the room even though you say, well, I'm not going to have a vote, you're not allowed to be in the, in the, in the actual, physically in the room if, if you are in a conflict, uh, no matter how minor that conflict is. And we've had a couple of fairly minor declarations here um, where the people had to be, not be in the room. So then if we had three people there, uh, and I guess it's just a question, and, and I'm, I'm certainly no legal expert on this, but would not not still be be deemed to have three councillors there and be deemed a meeting that that wasn't posted. But don't all the um, all the um, uh, agreed upon resolutions from a committee come to council for for um, uh, for their endorsement? I, I don't. I'm not aware of any that we would. Recom yes, recommendations yeah. would yeah. that are that are coming 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 from a steering committee meeting. So the fact that you can't vote there means that you wouldn't be in conflict, but they would come before council eventually as they emerge from the committee meeting. Yeah, okay, okay. 
Okay, Councilor McCordoff. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, from my point of view, as a, as a fairly new councillor, I would appreciate the opportunity to attend a meeting. I may not have been appointed to that, but um, just from uh, a learning experience and, and trying to be up to speed on some of the issues that are affected, I would, um, I would quite enjoy having that opportunity to go. That being said, if you had two councillors there, would that solve the problem? If you only had two, I mean, if is it is it the magic number between two and three that is what we're concerned about? Uh, that's a that's a that's a I'm good not question. Sure. That's a that's a that's a that's a good question, but but going to what Councillor Ryan was saying earlier, that anything that comes out of that select committee is going to have to come before council anyway. Um, I, I think that works actually. Uh, I'm going to say I stand corrected. Uh, Mr. Romanko, please. We're <laughs> Thank you, Mayor Wells. Uh, I, I'll offer some of my insights uh, and my experience in, in working with council members and I hope they won't take it in, in a negative. But. Uh, uh, certainly there's there's some optics and, and in my experience I've heard so many times of people saying well when the when the decision has been made what by the time it hits the council table because it was in, the decision was made in committee and as soon as you have a majority of of, uh, of uh, council members in the room the 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 optics are that there there was involvement in some way whether it be through direct or indirect influence so having a majority of council in the room certainly uh, sends a message uh, that potentially uh, a decision was made in a second way. Second one is, is that uh, uh, I, in my experience I find it uh, very difficult. People who have an interest in a particular subject area always tend to either be drawn into the deb deb debate in one way or another. Uh, either just by presence it's, or you know, if they have an interest it, it, it makes it very difficult for the chair of the committee to to keep order sometimes and oh, yeah, well we'll just you know what do you have to say about this and and all of a sudden you're drawn into, into the debate so whether the person intends to come to the meeting and say nothing often it's there uh, the presence uh, will draw that person in, into the meeting and uh, I think what we're looking for here is the ultimate transparency in council decision making and that is that council members in the majority don't attend committee meetings because it falls back on your other two councillors who are not there that you know they, they the feeling could be that they uh, didn't have the same opportunity although the decision is made here it's how that that discussion goes where they don't have the opportunity to have it and it draws upon the uh, the, the focus of the chair if it's in fact a council member to link with other council members and say, you know, what are your insights relative to this and bring those ideas to the table. So you have to take a look at the overall functioning of council committees and, and how they can best work without physical presence. And I guess maybe a part of that too would almost be like an error of omission. If you were at a meeting and didn't say anything, is that, is that taking a supportive role? On, on on a topic um, Wow uh, I, I certainly I certainly see both sides of this and I certainly see uh, where Councillor McCordoff is coming from particularly as a new councillor trying to gain information or really any councillor uh, looking to have <coughs> looking to have some some input but if you had if you were chairing the the uh, the dog park committee and you had a, a small number of of, uh, of citizens there, um, and then and then f three councillors show up. Um, I'm just wondering, you know, what the optics are, or or how how that fits with the community. This is councillor councillor Rhodes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. So, in reflection, uh, 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 often words that people say to you. Uh, uh, you know, get burned into your brain. And I remember uh, Grand Forks about five years ago when we received our first uh, 
counseling on conflict of interest and how uh, you should behave and act under certain circumstances and it rings uh, quite true that when you look at these kinds of situations that it's always best to uh, look at the worst case scenario not always not always the one that's in front of you and and open for decision and I believe that there is some legislation that uh, if you have if you achieve a quorum and I remember the words very well under any circumstances, whether it be uh, preconceived by having a select committee, uh, social events or anything. Mm -hmm. In the worst case scenario, that could be deemed as a meeting and subject to all of the, the protocol that's, uh, that's uh, set up for a meeting. I know that, that that's often hard to do because we do socialize uh, and we socialize together. Uh, and is that applicable to this select committee thing? Well, I'm not sure whether I'd want to take a chance uh, 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 making the wrong decision with a quorum present and that kind of thing. I certainly see the reason for it. Um, uh, I guess I would clearly put this in the category of being the downside of ha you know one of the negative factors of having a committee. But I think I would I would have a bit of a um, a problem supporting um, the essence of, of, of this uh, change in the resolution as you put it down uh, for that particular reason. Uh, uh, not that, that, it, that I'm thinking that it would ever happen, but there's always that what if. Uh, what if, if something did happen and it got challenged and it was deemed as a meeting, uh, we could be setting ourselves up for some pretty nasty stuff and I think for that reason uh, not that I'm being negative about it, because I understand the reason for putting that wording in there. I don't think personally I'd like to take a chance with um, achieving a quorum under those certain uh, circumstances. Great. Thanks, Councillor Rhodes. Uh, Councillor McCordoff, please. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, what, it, what it was being suggested says only those members of council appointed to a select committee shall attend committee meetings. If we ensure that there are two people appointed to every select committee, would that solve the problem? Then there could be two people there, and then that cannot be deemed a quorum. Is that correct? Mr. Romankel, please. Well, uh, I, most uh, processes have uh, a, a member of, of council uh, and and then, and we have had uh, committees in the past with more than one uh, councillor appointed to it. Depend depends on the size of, of the task type of thing. But then also the mayor is usually considered uh, an ad hoc member of of, in, of any committee. You know his his ability to attend mm -hmm. any meeting. So uh, again, uh, then that makes you know yeah you, you got to see how your numbers flow. Uh, to ensure that you you avoid the the optics of a of, mm -hmm. a, of a majority of council, and again, as we're as we're bringing community members out, uh, and we want their input. I don't know that we should have a great number of councillors there. They're going well. If you are here, why am I here? Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I'm not. Yeah. <laughs> okay, council, <laughs> council Pond. <laughs> Um, I, yes, I also have to agree a little bit with what Barry's saying when we talk about um, in uh, getting into a debate with, within a committee meeting. A lot of the committee meetings that I'm on, they may just be for information, but um, there's always two <coughs> eyes. If, if we have council members, there's eyes that are heading in that direction, either looking for that little nod, yes or no, or that approval. And like you say, if you're in a spot, um, right there is kind of giving an answer of why and, and we have to watch that, even though I agree with Sue that there are times where I would love to be in that meeting to get information. I think we leave it to our uh, council appointed as well as the co-council that we appoint. Uh, uh, most of our committees do have two, uh, just in case one cannot be there. Mm -hmm. And somehow we can um, put that mm -hmm. as part of this uh, to make sure that either one of those, and as Barry just said, our mayor is actually considered to be um, uh, to, to, to be to be there as well so uh, I think we have to leave it as is because uh, um, as as Councillor Rhodes also brought up is some of the legal uh, mm -hmm. issues that may come up come up with that as well mm -hmm. okay. Councillor Ryan uh, uh, well I, um, I I think that 
I, I sense a, a very uh, uh, kind of strict interpretation of uh, a possible um, quorum. Um, mm -hmm. And I, uh, I think that the way I, I read it, it, it's very clear. I mean, if, if, if the chairperson of the committee needs any ammunition, uh, all they have to do is cite that bylaw and say, look, the protocol says, the, the uh, procedural bylaw says that you, you have a voice but no vote. Uh, so, uh, you know, just you can observe, but um, otherwise <laughs> you, can't, you can't say anything, you can't ask a question and so on. Uh, I don't think we're going to be, to be um, I don't think it's going to, going to happen. I don't think we're going to frequent these meetings that much. But I, I, I don't know. I, I, I know that we've, we've tried to, to put everybody on the same level in the past. And I know I, I attended, not, I wasn't appointed to it, but in the light of the, uh, the then existing um, uh, uh, bylaw, I, I attended some of the meetings of the uh, Lake uh, Recreation and Commercial Use Task Force. And I found them fascinating. Just hearing the debate, I mean, which minutes, we all agree, I mean, even our own minutes don't adequately reflect the discussion that takes place. They reflect the, the results, but they don't reflect the, the, the various uh, things that are said and, and the arguments that are made and, and all the considerations that are given. And I think, um, you know, that I, I sense a kind of a movement back to silos uh, with, the, with this. I, I see it as restrictive on, on the, the, uh, the, uh, the scope of, of a counselor's uh, interests and duties. I mean, if three people came to a meeting, I would say, wow, there must be a lot of interest in, in this subject. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm, I'm going to uh, continue. I'm going to vote for my motion okay. as amended or my, for my motion. And uh, and I uh, I hope that uh, in the in the discussion that maybe someone else has uh, has changed their mind. Okay, and I, I guess uh, maybe for a, for a, a final word on that when we when we look at some of the some of the situations that Councillor Rhodes was talking about when we were uh, in rookie school in in Grand Forks, I know that if three councillors were in a coffee shop and having a quite a quite a little discussion about an issue and somebody at the next table picked it up and could go well that was that was a that was a, a duly uh, that was a, a council meeting there was three of them there and uh, and they had a quorum and that that would be conduct conducting business and I distinctly recalled uh, being advised not to go there which was what councillor Rhodes brought forward um, and as whether again and going back to the statement I brought about the conflict uh, you can't be in the room because you can you can also uh, influence people duly influence people uh, by your presence so and and when I have that ability um, to be an ad hoc member of most committees um, I actually sort of go out of my way to stay away although I I'm very interested there um, if, we, if we have councillors sharing those those uh, select committees, if we have them doing some chairing things there, I, I think it's better that they chair and bring it back to council um, because rather without my influence. So I, I actually go out of my way to sort of pull back of those a little bit for, for other people to, to be able to take direction. So um, that's, that's my input into it. <laughs> been a great dialogue by the way <laughs> <laughs> Councillor McCordoff. Thank you Mr. Mayor um, I guess I was just looking at the meeting that we held last week uh, about the Red Cross and um, and you appointed Councillor Ryan and I to be on that and me excuse me to be on that committee and um, and so uh, you know there were two of us there and I think it helped in uh, moving forward on what had been decided and what we ended up doing and I think that sometimes when you have two people there um, it you know it one person remembers one thing and one remembers another so I'd hate to rely on my memory totally to remember all the all the details so I'm while I'm certainly don't think we want to have three there if that's going to cause a problem I do think that in many instances two counselors is Appropriate. I'll put it that way. And I, I think that's a, that, I think that's a good comment. And that that Red Cross situation did work so well with both you and Councillor Ryan on there. 
uh, and maybe that's what 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 and that's my call probably mm -hmm. as a mayor maybe I should be putting two people on and that that covers everything and yet it doesn't get into